Well, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm really delighted to welcome you on today's webinar, Hub Solutions for Local uh, and Intercontinental uh, Impact. So my name is Maysam Rabbit. I'm the director of the AfriLabs community. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, AfriLabs, AfriLabs is a Pan-African initiative and a multi-stakeholder partner uh, supporting tech innovation ecosystems across Africa. Uh, we do this leveraging one of the largest network of uh, hubs with more than 500 tech innovation hubs in 53 countries in Africa. Um, and uh, today we will explore the important role of innovation hubs uh, in fostering entrepreneurship, economic growth, uh, and regional development across Africa. Our discussion, a city of a thousand villages, will highlight those um, the impact of these hubs as they act as catalysts for entrepreneurial success, providing resources, uh, fostering collaborations, and supporting startups while addressing challenges uh, such as funding, infrastructure, and the need for policy support. Um, this webinar is the first uh, in a pre-AAG series, uh, series designed to open discussions around the tracks of our upcoming annual gathering event. Um, this is an event happening every year in a different country. Um, and um, I'd like to acknowledge and welcome our labs, our esteemed host partner, uh, track sponsor and lead of the Hub Solution Track. Uh, this year, our annual gathering is happening in Cape Town, South Africa from the 6th to the 8th of November, and we're expecting all of you to join us. Um, we're really happy and proud to be part partnering with our labs whose support was uh, really important into driving forward the conversations and solutions that will shape the future of our innovation hubs across Africa. Um, we are privileged to hear uh, from expert speakers uh, today, um, TD from TVC Labs, hi. Uh, Cheryl Jacob from E Squared Investments, Alfredo Quanda from Iderio Venture Studio, and Rene Parker from R Labs. Our session will be moderated by Christine Nicola Tafel from R Labs team. I'm confident that today's discussions will be both insightful and inspiring. Thank you for all joining us. Um, now I'd like it to pass the mic to you, Christine, our moderator for officially welcoming and guide us through this webinar. And I will invite all of you here in the room to share uh, your name, your hub, or your the name of your organization, your LinkedIn, and tell us where are you connecting from? I'm connecting from Tunisia. Over to you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mesa. Thank you to everyone who has joined us today. I am super stoked because, of course, this topic is really close to our, to our heart because at some point in our lives, we have all been, we either started a hub, we formed part of our hub. And so to stand on this side of, of to stand on this side of the, of the line is, I think, a more of a privilege um and so yeah i'm gonna get i'm gonna get straight straight into it um just to our audience let's keep the questions going throughout we're definitely gonna have an opportunity to share um i mean at least to hear from our from our panelists um at the end at the end of our discussion um yes okay so i trust that we are ready and as excited as what i am um formalities so hub solution um really the goal the goal for us is you know to create a space but also to create 
a seamless flow of, of, of knowledge and capital, as well as opportunities across borders. And the question is always how, right? How do we, how do, we do this? And we know that by collaborating with global partners, um, I mean, I think we really pass, we, we pass, we cannot just talk about yeah, I'm, our immediate stakeholders, but we have to see ourselves as, as global. Um, and in this way, we can help our startups, our hubs, um, you know, scale, scale faster, but not just faster, efficiently as well. And so, and it's really to address, you know, local, local challenges and, and, you know, just reflecting, reflecting upon this, I was, I was like, it's so imperative, like this gathering is imperative, this platform is imperative um, for us, you know, to address the real challenges that is affecting real people, but also, you know, the challenges that, that the, the, the people that can actually help the people doing the work, you know, and that, and that is, and it's as simple as, it's as simple as that. So, um, I'm, I'm a very, I'm a very a, a simple kind of person and I absolutely love getting my hands, my hands dirty. And so today we have incredible esteemed men and women that has gone through this. Some of them are still in it. Um, some of them, you know, has achieved incredible milestones. They're sitting with, you know, challenges that, that, that they've gone through. They, we have an opportunity to learn from these individuals. And so without further ado, you know, I just, I want to get straight into today's discussion. Just as Mesa um, mentioned, um, we are talking about, about hub solutions for local and intercontinental impact. And I'm going to have our panelists um, introduce, introduce themselves. But of course, we want to hear more. Okay, so who are you? You know, which the country that you're representing, the company that you're representing, um, and maybe something something that nobody else know know about you. <laughs> um, I think that would would you know disrupt it a little. So I'm going to hand over. I'm gonna have um, Alfredo Kawando Kawando um, introduce himself first, and then we can just naturally flow to our to the rest of the panelists. So over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I see a lot of friendly faces here. Uh, it's been a while. <laughs> um, but I'm Alfredo Kwanda. I'm based in Maputo, Mozambique. I'm the founder. I'm a business designer and investor in a venture called uh, Idiario, which is uh, essentially is a venture studio. This is like the maturity of, of, uh, of a hub came about to become a venture studio. And uh, we focus more on the, the Lusophone uh, countries uh, here in Africa, because that's for us, it became the underserved kind of like a part of the equation because we have the Francophone, Anglophone, but Lusophone is part of it, but it wasn't being well represented. So narrowed down, to that niche is where we are providing uh, our support. Something that people uh, <laughs> don't know about me, I think this is a strange thing, but uh, I'm a great dancer. Like, uh, yeah, that's that's one of the things that people can know about me. So our next panelist, thank you. Renee? Oh. Uh, Cheryl. Oh, you're getting alphabetical orders, Cheryl. Sorry. <laughs> Is that what we're doing? I didn't realize we're doing alphabets, but uh... <laughs> hi, oh. everyone. <laughs> My name is Cheryl Jacob. I work for E Squared Investments. Uh, we're based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, a part of my role is to really invest in uh, social entrepreneurs and some of them running hubs. Um, my One of my investees is our labs, and so very like, grateful to be here and share with you. I'm trying to think of one thing um, you might not know about me, and I'm like, oh, I don't even know what's the right thing to share here. Um, but uh, I grew up playing the piano, 
maybe and I never played because it was a dream of my mom's that she forced me to live out for her and so it's now a regret as an adult so I wished I continued but um but yeah I think when you're a rebel in your teenage years you kind of just tell your parents like yeah I'm not doing that not not living your dreams and so <laughs> yeah thank you thank you Cheryl <laughs> okay I'll go. I'm Rene Falker from Arlet. Yeah. I'm in Cape Town, Cape Town, South Africa. The sun is shining here today, so I think all the Cape Townians are extremely happy. Um, as our labs, we are a social enterprise. We were both in Cape Town, but we actually have a global footprint. Um, we work with marginalized communities and we train our people um, and then people start businesses and then we help them incubate and then we're helping scale. So our latest, I'll call it an adventure and not just a venture, is that we started a fund to invest in these very businesses that we've helped um, grow from the, the ground up. I'm also a board member for AfriLabs representing Southern Africa. And something people don't know about me, oh my goodness. Um, I actually wanted to be a ballerina when I was um, not just little, but also in my teenage and adult life, but I have no sense of balance. So that did not go so well for me. Thank you. Hi, that leads to geriatric. <laughs> Hi everybody. Uh, my name is Tommy Davis, but you can call me TD. Uh, and I run an outfit called TDC Labs out of Lagos in Nigeria. And our team, what we do is we try and find. Um, then when we found, we then get them funded and then we get out of the way and we follow. Who are these people? Well, these are innovative African founders who are building high impact, and I mean socially, not just economically, high impact ventures um, that have the capability to really create value to a significant number of people. And we've been doing that for a while now. And um, yeah, that's pretty much what we do. Something nobody knows about me. I think my life is an open book. Every time I say something, it ends up, somebody says, oh, but that's already on the internet. <laughs> so um, I think my favorite claim to fame is what I will use. And that's the fact that there's this tiny little company called Marks and Spencer. If you've ever heard of them, well, I built the very first Marks and Spencer website and actually registered that domain name on the internet. Go figure. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to our, our panelists. And I'm just around, yes, a round of applause, a round of applause to, to, to our panelists. Um, and I am, the, and of course, the reason why I asked, you know, share something about you that nobody, nobody will know, because in the movement of solving challenges for people and for hubs, it means that we have to be ready to be a little uncomfortable and vulnerable and talk about the things that you know nobody nobody might know but to make sure that we remain um you know we have empathy empathy for people but also you know relevant and so that's why I shaked it a little up um because that's what happened in the work <laughs> on the ground that uh, you know so yeah so who who shall it be um Oh, I've got lots, lots of questions, um, and 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 I'm hoping we're gonna get we're gonna get through it. Um, but I know that there's there's been a bit of a a more of a celebration for 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 some of us uh, more than others. Um, I'm going to ask um, kickstart with Alfredo, um, only because um, he's he's achieved quite a quite a milestone um, this year. And I'm not going to talk about it. So just 
as a long standing member of of Afri Labs and I mean you've been in in the network for a very very long time um would like to if you could just share with us today you know what are some of your your thoughts on hub evolution but specifically share with us you know some of those growth strategies that you've um implemented um in your hub um over to you Alfredo and that's not an easy question to answer uh <laughs> I think I'm, I'm being fortunate to not see only uh, my version of how a hub should uh, kind of uh, can succeed in, in emerging markets such as uh, the African one. But I've been traveling across uh, the world and kind of like learned a little bit here and there. And uh, we apply what we have learned. Um, and uh, there are a couple of things that I see as a trend. First and foremost, I think like uh, we need to praise the work and efforts of Afri Labs to kind of like bring those hubs from isolation to start to connect, exchange uh, opportunities, ideas, get to know each other one way or another. Why? Because there's a lot of, uh, I will call it like silent debt of hubs. It means that like uh, they can raise today do a lot of hustle and bustle and then out of nowhere like no one knows what it is where it's not uh so on and so forth that is one way of of putting that so the need to i think we go to our kind of like uh, that it takes uh, a village to raise a key that it takes an ecosystem to raise a hub or a startup it's apl applicable here and what this networking is doing is kind of like empowering that. Uh, we take all of us to, to kind of like to raise those business. So uh, I think like uh, because we are gravitating towards having these three uh, buckets of, uh, of systems of, uh, or ecosystem in Africa, which are Lusophone, Anglophone, and Francophone, I think uh, we thought it was everything was the same. Uh, it doesn't matter because we are in Mozambique, we're Portuguese speaking, but we, we thought we were all the same, but it's not. There's some similarities, some level of, of, of I, I think like common, not language in terms of speaking language, but language in terms of like how we approach things culturally that ended up gravitating. And then what we ended up figuring out that we that impacted our growth first was the pattern of maturity. It means that every hub needs to understand the pattern of maturity. You cannot stay for five to 10 years doing the same thing over and over and over and over. Like that's not how it's supposed to be. You need to do one thing. You need to figure out. You need to outgrow yourself. You need to go to the next step. And uh, from that maturity comes to involve first the business model. Uh, what I've seen and what we have done, we need, we approach the hybrid business model. It means that we are we have one entity that is for profit, one another entity that is non profit. Those two things needs to exist because, like uh, at the end of the day, a hub is a business. We if you don't tackle this as a business, like. The, you will fail. That's that. That is one of the things that I've seen uh, as the main reason for a lot. Uh, so passionate about it, but they forget that it is a business. You need to address as a business. So having the hybrid model, you need to figure out how that can work specifically from your countries. In some countries, you can be a for profit that owns a non profit, and the other one is the other way around. But you need to understand uh, those two. Um, ways of being uh, to unlock the majority of, of resources, networking, capital, as possible that you can have. That is one thing. The other thing is uh, to understand that uh, there is a shift, a generational shift. It means that there is a role of us that we've been doing for this for so long to teach others, the newer, the, the emerging uh, hubs, like how to do it correctly. That is also the role that we need to understand um, how we play this role. So this is why, for example, one of the milestones that we were talking about here is, for example, this this year, the, for the next three years, we'll be setting up three regional hubs across Mozambique. So this is not me and my small hub in one province. This is now we are playing a major role that includes a hub that will be like a 
that will be answering to three or four provinces at the same time. So those kind of hubs, they can create a better impact. Those kind of hubs can open doors. Those are the, the hubs that investors want to deal with because of the scale. Uh, those are the kind of hubs that we can deal better with legislators. That, that's the, the, the kind of hubs that we are interested in. So we are pay, passing out everything that we learn to put it in those hubs. The other thing is we shift from our growth became something different. Our growth went from dealing with 100,000 of people to dealing with less people, uh, to dealing with less founders and uh, operators, uh, investors, and so on, to deal with high growth uh, startups, uh, scale ups, because at the, we need also those that can uh, unlock the majority of opportunities of the market are less and not the majority of them. I think like uh, Dave Tommy Davis was talking a little bit about this. And uh, for that, you need focus. You need focus of capital. You need focus of resources. And that is uh, the maturity of all of us to, to, that we have figured out uh, uh, in the market. And last but not least is to understand that, that the role of uh, of hubs is also dealing with the ecosystem in itself when it comes to policies, investments, all those things that constrain wow. uh, uh, the ecosystem itself is also <laughs> responsibility uh, of the hub. And this is why we deal with policies. We are there. We are putting our fingers there. We are on those tables. We want to be on those tables where those decisions are, are being made. So for us, this is the change that uh, we felt uh, throughout the years. This is what made what we are today. When we're talking about becoming an adventure studio, it's just like we're just narrowed down and focusing all of our effort, all of our networks, all of our, uh, uh, the ecosystem community that we have behind us to make a really change what it matters the most. Because at this time, it's not about just adding numbers. Uh, it's about really unlocking the ecosystem as a whole. And this is why we also narrowed down even to work with uh, uh, Portuguese-speaking countries in Africa, uh, because at the end of the day, they, they are also in need of expertise that some markets are ahead, some are not. So we're just uh, trying to help them uh, kind of like succeed uh, also. So this is more or less the growth that I've seen, the change that I've seen, and uh, the path that we have taken as a hub throughout uh, the years that I've seen that this trend also, those that are succeeding uh, in the continent in terms of hub are more or less tapping in into this level uh, of growth, going from starting from incubation, those programs and so on, scaling up and starting to become a business, prioritize, diversify, becoming profit, non-profit, then start to deal with policies and so on, and then create a fund. That's the race of, of, of maturity that we need to speak more about. Uh, and I would love to see and speak more about this uh, uh, during the, the session at the end of, of the year, but it's something that I'm very excited about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, um, Alpedo. And I mean, you did say it was a really difficult answer, but I think I think you I think the dip was exactly what we what we needed. And one of the things that kept on kept on surfacing um, was one. You know, resources play such a huge role in in, in what we do. Um, and in the evolution and in the involvement of any of any hub as 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 people as well. And so I would I would like to, you know, just have um um Cheryl Jacob, you know, share with us, you know, she's a she's she's got quite an extensive extensive ex expertise and she's quite a known as a as a development um, development practitioner, you know, and if she could maybe just she if you could share with us um, what is your opinion of the the current funding and investment landscape um, for hubs and investors? Because of course, this is a a question, it's a topic, a hot topic. We know that uh, um, in in these discussions, and of course, our objective is to make sure that today we walk away um, with with answers that 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 we need, you know. And so let's let's get into yeah. this. Over to you, um, Cheryl. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, this is the this is the question, right? Where's the money at? Oh, 
<laughs> always. Uh, I think the funding landscape has definitely changed over time. I think what we're seeing is that a lot more funding is coming to Africa, as it should. Uh, rightfully so. I think that we're growing. I think that we're starting to do really clever and innovative things here. And I think it's right that we start to get the attention we need to get the resourcing that we need. And whilst venture capital has probably been the biggest movement that we have on the continent, I think what we're finding is that it's quite concentrated in very specific uh, areas. So like fintech, for example, would be one of them, agri-tech, um, edtech, for example. So for those who play in other spaces, it's a little bit harder to be able to access the funding that's available. And then the funding is coming from a number of different players, you know, from governments itself, from DFIs, uh, multinationals, um, you know, angel investors. It's actually quite a broad spectrum of funding that's available. But then again, access to it is where um, we're finding is the hardest thing. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. I think one of it is that it's very concentrated. So Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa, we seem to attract almost all of the funding that's available somehow. And the smaller uh, countries uh, tend to, um, you know, kind of just get the leftovers, Alfaro. I'm sure you know what that means, right? Like your neighbor, South Africa, gets a lot more than you do. Um, but then the other things that we're finding is that even when access to funding is available, infrastructure is not always in place. So reliable internet, for example, or even, you know, finding innovators who are doing clever things, but not having the, you know, physical infrastructure like, you know, public works and, and you know, transport uh, systems. Um, and I think for me, one of the other ones in South Africa, it's no, uh, yeah, we, we used to this is our power supply. There's just intermittent power supply across the continent. So there's a number of things that's affecting the amount of capital available, or if it is available, how are we accessing it? Um, I think for me, one of the things around this uh, capital landscape currently is where are you playing and how relevant are you? And how are you partnering up to be able to access the resources that are available? So if you are a fintech or an edtech, how are you bringing other players, collaborators along with you to be able to access funding that's available? Um, I know you have lots of questions, so I'm going to stop there just as a wide overview, and I'm sure we can delve into some of it a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much, um, Shiro, Shiro for that. I am going to ask, which I think is, is quite quite relevant. Um, I'm going to ask um, TD, just you know, as chief of in of chief or uh, as the chief of innovator at TV TV Labs. Um, we know that you sit with a wealth of, of experience and and insights, and and we'd love to just if you could just share with us, you know, how you have used your exp expertise, you know, to orchestrate relevant and stimulating discussions that cater to the specific needs and goals of hub leaders and stakeholders. Uh, yeah, over to you, TD. Um, I, I think, if you don't mind, I'd like to touch on quite a number of things that are interrelated um, to that. And really, it's the nature of the hubs and the role they play within the ecosystem itself and the reason being i i have a slightly privileged position in that in addition to running uh, an innovation hub that is tvc labs where um, as i explained earlier what we do is identify these the founders and then get them funded um i'm also an angel investor um, that actually invests in the startups. Um, but I wanted to come at it from the hub perspective because that's what we're talking about um, here and the fact that they are critically important um, to the development of the startups um, on, on the... Uh, on the continent and the, the first part is about the community engagement and development itself because you have to be part of a community and as a digital well in our case we're a digital entrepreneurship organization but as an entrepreneurship support organization the question is what is that community that you are plugging into okay how do you relate to the academic 
ecosystem, for example, from where a significant number, you know, of the founders arise. How do you relate to the somebody? Uh, I think it, it it was Cheryl earlier that was talking about the development partners, okay, who have a critical role to play in funding innovation hubs uh, within your ecosystem. How do you, um, as Alfredo was talking about, how about the policymakers, okay, who are actually shaping everything? So how do you sit within that community is sort of the first thing uh, being addressed. Once that's been looked at, um, the question then becomes resource, okay? Um, yes, funding is is a tough, tough one for the startups, not talking for the hubs. We tend to look at the startups and we think that translates, but hubs do not get the same level of funding as startups do. They're two totally different worlds because you're the supporting act, you're not the revenue generator, okay? So you are a catalyst. The idea being they will grow, but you've got to keep level paced. And that <clears throat> is where the market expansion and scalability that Alfred was talking about, which is where going across Mozambique, becomes important because you've got to leverage scale to be sustainable. You can't be a one-man riot act and expect to run a sustainable or a reasonable hub. If you look at what we've done, for example, at CC Hub, okay, where you know I, I chair the board, it's gone, you know, across the piece, multi-country, with a presence in Rwanda, a presence in Kenya, and a presence in Nigeria, giving us that capability to help to grow the startup to expand, okay, and become almost language agnostic. But those are some of the critical considerations. Um, multilinguality, okay, whether we like it or not. Yes, I know we talk about Anglophone, Francophone, and I'm one of the proponents, but guess what? With AI, local language is going to move to center stage. Ignore that at your peril, okay? So it's those kind of, that kind of thinking we've got to start to look at. How am I going to get um, a Swahili geography book? You know, when am I going to have an AUSA chemistry book, okay, that can be accessed by these? So these are some of the things that are being looked at across the piece that affects everybody. I trust that helps. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that, PD, and just for bringing it together. Um, I mean, both both responses from Cheryl and, and Alfredo, and just to see that, you know what, we, we cannot... If we're evolving in any evolution, we we do need we do need one another. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Renee Renee just to share with us. I know that she's also got extensive experience. You know, um, our labs has been around what for for fifteen years, and and you know as the ecosystem ecosystem matures, the need for specialized support and structures. Uh, we've seen it, you know, it becomes, it's pretty um, crucial. So, our, our, and we know that our labs is at the forefront of this evolution. So, you know, offering tailored programs um, that cater to specific industry needs. So the question to you today is, um, share with us, you know, some of the thoughts behind our labs expansion um, plans. Uh, yeah, over to you, uh, Renee. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. You know, you spoke about, um, Maturity only happens with time, right? So, and it means people need to be busy and doing things in order for, for them to mature. And then I know we, you know, we're saying um, there's a critical need now for specialization. I don't think the need is just now. It's always been there. It's only now that we're using words or, or you know, we have the language that can identify the needs. It's always, it's always been there. Um, and I think that's one of the crucial things that we're seeing now is that as with its hubs, with its innovators or the entire ecosystem, we're finally getting to a place um, many years later. It could have been accelerated a little faster, but of course there are, are, are reasons for that. But now we actually have you know, words that we can use to describe it. So it's not just you saying something and nobody else knows what you 
what you're talking about. But that, again, that only comes with time. And when I think about, okay, so what about hubs that are just starting out or, you know, people feel, you know, they're early in the ecosystem. Um, it's exactly the same for them, you know. It's, it's not that you're starting from scratch. The ecosystem has matured and I don't think it's going to stop maturing. And we're actually evolving as much as we feel as hubs we've evolved. I mean, I listened to Alfredo speak about other and, and even having a different form of registration to be able to, to manage that. We are going to see this trend and we don't know what is next. Um, you know, and that's one of the, the, the really interesting things. And for, for our lab and our expansion model it has been based exactly on that. You can't be the same forever. You know, when you, when you start out, there's certain things you need, there's certain language you understand and, and partners you have. And as you mature, that matures with you. And making sure that as you're maturing in the ecosystem, that you're not doing it in isolation. And I think, you know, with all the panelists, this is something that we've all spoken about. We can't do it alone. We need different players and not just players that look like you, that talk like you, that's in your ecosystem. We need to be prepared to work with people that are completely different to us. This is what maturity needs, right? Or, or at least this is what drives maturity or it's a sign of maturity. When we're actually okay to collaborate and partner um, or, or enter into a, a different sector that we never thought we would before. And yeah, and, and for our labs, you know, being, we always talk about innovation and technology and being at the cutting edge of that. Um, and, and that transcends um, culture, language, um, even the, the phase of the innovators that we work with, where they're at. But we do know one thing, at this specific point in time in 2024, there is an urgency on the continent. There's a, a difference. You, you can feel it in the energy. You can feel it when you talk to people, when you talk to young people, even people that's not in business yet, even to the people that don't call themselves entrepreneurs. There's something that is so different about this moment in time. I don't want to say it's, oh, because it's post-COVID, because that definitely changed all of us. I'm really hopeful, you know, that this is a sign that we are matured and we are we're still maturing and, and looking at what is the next wave what is the next wave of innovation? What's the next wave of funding that's going to come our way? Or do we need to just do our own funding? You know, um, so I'm just going to stop. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Renee. And, and, and I, I, I'm going to ask Alfredo, maybe, maybe just to share with us really quickly, um, you know, what advice would you would you give emerging hubs? Emerging hubs, and, and is it very different to is it very different to what you would that to the advice that you will actually give a more established a more established hub? Um, yeah. Uh, well, I think this is a critical question because uh, because we are evolving. It means that uh, if we move from the space that we are, someone else will fill that gap, that void, and um, uh, sometimes we even don't know that uh, those hubs ended up existing in the same space that you are in just because you're not well connected uh, enough to know who is playing what. But I will give my first advice to, to, to emerging um, hubs, uh, operators. Uh, I will give operators, not just the founder. A hub is a different kind of beast in terms of a business. But I will give the first is the thing that I said, which is like, you need to understand the hub as a business. You need to understand the fundamental of a business. That's the first thing that uh, that it's important to acknowledge and know. It needs the, the understanding of you need to solve the problem for others. Uh, that needs to be their value needs to be given. And by the same time that you need to give uh, that value, you need to understand the, the concept of cash flow. Because like you need to have fuel to keep on going. Like uh, this is this, this, this game is hard. We cannot just the same thing that entrepreneurs by itself is like like complex. Uh, you need to understand the concept of cash flow. You need to have money enough to keep on running whatever it is that you're running. 
So treat it as a business. That's the first thing. The second thing is to leverage technologies. Uh, we are at the playing level field like we've never been before. Leverage AI, leverage uh, machine learning, like, like no, it's no one's business because that will give a boost that will make you productize, systemize whatever you're doing. It means that you will have to, uh, kind of like, instead of you having a thousand people working for your hub, you can have a tenth of that in doing the same level of work. From what uh, TD said, like uh, language is not a barrier. If you understand and translate uh, going that route, just making sure that you leverage technology. So have your technology as your allies. Start it, invest in them, and make sure that you use strategically to improve whatever you build once. You can deliver it to as many people as possible. That needs to be a continuous uh, kind of like source of generated income sources and kind of like expanding your network. Third, last but not least, it's just like build a community. At the end of the day, uh, like the community of partners that you ended up having, founders, investors, mentors, everything. It's about community. A hub is about community. So you need to be very intentional how you build that community. Why? Because your hub is as valuable as the community it serves on one side. And on the other side, it's like your growth is directly linked to the quality of the community of the network that you have. So know how to intentionally Build a community around your business, around the hub, and the quality of that community needs to be maintained, linked, because wherever you want to go, if you can leverage your community to get there, it means that you're doing a good job. So those three key points are the ones that I can leave for this emerging generation of hub operators. Love it. I absolutely, I absolutely love it. And we're going to continue. Remember, at the beginning, I said we at the end, we're going we're gonna to walk away with, with a solid toolbox. Um, and so I'm going to going to ask Cheryl, just as head of social um, entrepreneurship at E Squared um, Investments, you know, what is the value proposition you look for in a potential investment? Um, I'm just going to repeat it again. What is the value proposition you look for for potential investment? Cool. Yeah, very clever question. I think there's a number of things that, you know, at E-squared, if I'm just thinking about E-squared that we look at, but I think investors across the spectrum look at this. Um, one is, do you have a sustainable business model? I think it's so easy to start something because you like it, but uh, that's the starting point. You <laughs> like it, <laughs> like what you're doing, but make sure that it's sustainable, that you have a model and you partner with people who are really going to help you build out something that will last long before you do, long after you do, after. I meant after, <laughs> long after you do. Um, and the other one is built for scale. I love what Afara says. You know, you're not just out there in your little community doing your thing just by yourself and feeling really excited with yourself. Can you build a model that's scalable? So, you know, I might be the partner and, you know, at Eastgrade we have risk capital. So we'll come alongside you and test something. Pilot it out. That's great. But are you building scalability and applicability into that so that you can take that model after you fine tuned it and then you're able to plant it elsewhere or in many elsewhere and then you're able to impact a lot more lives. Uh, the other one is innovation. Can you embed innovation in it? We don't want to just fund the same thing over and over. It's not exciting for us as investors. I'm just going to be so honest. Give us some innovation. Give us something to be excited about. Give us something exciting to take back to our investment committees that I can say, oh, I can really lobby for this because there's something exciting and innovative and a real problem that you're solving in the world. And in investors really want to invest in innovations. And so for me, that's a really important value proposition at eSquared. It's one of the things we put most of our focus on is how much innovation can a social innovator embed in one particular investment. Another one is a strong team. And I think it's something we don't always focus on. I think entrepreneurs are solopreneurs. Sometimes you want to just do it yourself. Taking others along can be so frustrating to get them on the same page as you because you didn't sleep all night. You have the ideas. You know what you need to do. But then to rally a team and get them to buy in and then to actually do the thing takes time. But actually things that live long after you do means that you have to have a team. You have to have people who can you know, do the thing when you're not there. And so for us, looking at teams and the composition of the teams and uh, the relatability of that team, the capabilities of that team becomes really, really important. So as a value proposition for us, 
It's about who comes to us for an investment. Are you in a team or are you on your own? The chances are if you're on your own, you don't have a support system. And the chances of that particular offering really going the long run is, is quite limited. And then the last one is the collaborative uh, potential. So for us, we really invest in collaborations. We want to know that you're not working in isolation, that in the ecosystem, you've looked at who your partners are, you know what your value is, you know what their value is, and you know that when you bring your value and their value, you, you know, you're amplifying the impact that you can have. There's so much value in collaborations, and yet we really do undervalue it. And so for us, we invest in collaborations. It's one of our things that we put a focus on at eSquared because we really want co-investment. So not just partnerships in terms of who else can you bring to your cap table, but who else can you implement this with? Uh, in tandem. And so those I'm going to leave with as the four important things for us. There's a long list, but I think that those are the most important things that you can take away today to say, if you're not building a strong team, get people around you who are on the same page as you, who want to run towards the same vision as you, um, you know, make sure that you are really building out strong, sustainable models. If you don't have the right people around you, how are you asking for help? Are you finding the right financial um, expertise, um, you know, in your ecosystems, in your communities to come alongside you and build a revenue model. And then at the same time, you know, are you being collaborative enough to make sure that it's not your idea and you're not, you're not operating from a scarcity um, mindset, but you really are thinking about there's enough for all of us, there's abundance for all of us, and we can all make an impact jointly. Thank you. Thank you so much you know, for bringing, bringing that to us. I think just as a, as a, as a reminder, that at some point we've all started, whether it's the startup, whether it's the hub, whether it's a project, we've all started um, with the with with heart, and that we want whatever we're doing. I'm sure everyone has this desire that it lives on, right? It's for it's for legacy, um, and so yeah, it's that that just just reminded me. It's it's always going back to why why am I doing what I'm doing, um, and that's why it's important that. You know, we put things in place, processes, um, team, <laughs> you know, we put that because th those are those are crucial aspects. And uh, yeah, so thank you so much um, for reminding us uh, why we do what we do. So we need to put in place things now, measures now um, for scale. Um, TD, I um, you know, your role, your role as track, track champion, um, you know, really, really trans transcends beyond beyond and, and and I I really want you to share, I would love for you to share just some of your experiences um, on cross collaboration and some of the challenges. Okay. Um, because we, we we have to talk about the you know the real the real thing. <laughs> you know, some of the challenges that innovators and tech hubs hubs face. Um, yeah. Over to you TD. Yeah, I, I think we need to separate of operations from the startups themselves. And and I think that's the first thing we don't do because we start talking about the hubs and we very quickly, because they're more flashy and more enamoring, we start talking about the startups and you know what they're about. But if we step back and look at hubs um, themselves and you know what has become the phenomenon we call Afri Labs and why Afrilabs has become so powerful um, is because of the interdependencies we have. There isn't any single hub, in my opinion, okay, and I stand to be corrected, that can actually meet all the capabilities of any ecosystem. That's the reality. Why is that? Because First of all, just look at the ratios, the numbers ratios. Um, if you're running any cohort, just the word cohort tells you all, okay? It's multiple, you know, 10 startups, 15. Then you get an application of a couple of hundred that you have to whittle down. You start to see that you've got to start to get on board the hub team as a primary focus first to, to start with. You've got to have the team that understands the dynamics of startup and venture development in general. So they know the difference between a startup that's just an MVP and one that's a pre-series A. 
Okay, I'm not talking about the startups themselves. I'm talking of your team that's running the hub and their ability to discern the needs being different. Okay, whereas, you know, for example, if you're midstream pre series A, if you don't have your governance, okay, right, you know you're not going to get to series A. But if you're starting at MVP, guess what? Yeah, it's important to have a board in place, but governance is probably not as significantly important at that stage as customer acquisition and growth. So again, it's about the journey and the balance, okay, understanding. That's what I'm talking about, your staff in the hub, having an understanding of. And it's there that collaboration kicks in because you're going to find, okay, people that run workspaces as their hubs, okay, have a totally, you know, the commercial intention is to utilize the space utilization. So it's how many more people I can get frequently running. And my economics are totally different, okay, from a biodiversity hub that's focused on the expertise being the capability they use to push the startups they take on board through in terms of their venture building, ensuring that their technical capabilities, okay, meet the standards industry is requiring of them, okay? In that case, your staff better understand who are the experts in the ecosystem that we can bring our startups to, and that's a totally different need yet again. So it's about understanding the dynamics of need of your hub from a resource control standpoint so that you can collaborate, be cross-border or even internally. Why? Because your expertise is defined and they the other hubs know what you're bringing to the party. And that's what Afri Labs has been amazingly good at, is that capability to say, look, this is our agenda. Uh, we want to talk to all of those who have an interest in the uh, agri-tech realm, but with a focus on carbon trading. And then the hubs show up and the startups by implication show up. So... Where am I going with all of this? We are moving to topic-based collaborations. So increasingly, it is going to be the themes that matter. Okay. Um, we're talking, we've talked circular economy. We've talked biodiversity. We're talking of carbon. We're talking of a whole host, okay, of agendas that are emerging, realizing and recognizing why is that so because at the end of the day, we just talked about, we don't control the purses. I don't mean it disrespectfully. Africa has its challenges, and we know what they all are, but the funding to solve the problems, i.e. the funding for the startups, last I checked, we did what, 6 billion in 2022? Guess what? Less than 20% of it came from the continent itself. But we've got to understand the mindset of the funders to be sure that we are helping our startups, okay, prepare in a way that it meets their requirements so that they can scale and grow and become, you know, the kind of startups uh, we're talking about today. I trust that helps. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that, for that, TD. Um, thank you to our panelists who are also, um, you know, just answering some of the questions in the in the chat box. Um, we really appreciate it because I know that we we pressed for time, and I know so so many people are <laughs> are quite invested in the in the conversation. Um, and so we'll continue we'll continue that. Um, Renee, this one this one is for you. Um, so on the continent, of course, we 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 experiencing a shift and I think you've mentioned that you've mentioned it earlier about this about the shift shift right and there seems to be some some demands of of entrepreneurs or, or hubs or um you know leaders and what is what is what role do you believe or at least does owners believe um what role does hubs and, and hub networks play in this in this specific shift thank you thank you Christine so, so the reason our labs decided to be part of the hub solutions track, so of course, we're extremely passionate about it, um, about the Afri Labs network and understanding it's a network of hubs. So hubs, we know, can we can evolve. 
um, we have the freedom and the flexibility to shift and to change to address the needs as it happens. There are very few instruments that is able to do that, right? Because either you are a business or you call yourself a startup and there's certain things that, that govern you. But as a hub, and this is also my opinion, we are able to shift as the need arises, as we mature, as the ecosystem matures, as the innovators that we're working with matures, as hubs, we are able to shift. We are able to be what they need us to be. So at, at our labs, we use the example of, we, we believe in being the first investors in our entrepreneurs, in our, in our innovators, um, because they don't have access to capital in another way. Right. So when you when you look for funding, they always ask you where have you raised money before, who's given you capital before. So the entrepreneurs that we work with generally have never raised money before. They can't go to a bank. They don't have someone to stand surety for them, and all these other challenges. So as a hub, we were able to become that. You know, to become the they use the term friends, fools, and family. It's normally the first people that give you money. I don't know which one we are. But we become that for our entrepreneurs when they need it, right? And then we work with different institutions, government um, organizations, corporates, academia. We are able to do that because we understand it's always about creating opportunities and giving access to those that don't have access. Our role as hub is very crucial in the sense that we can unlock so many things. But in order for us to do that, we need to know who we are. Like we need to understand what is our vision? What is our mission? And as a hub, identify that, you know, like pull your own identity. And then that is what you become strong in. And a lot of the time, I mean, for our labs 15 years later, even this morning, we just had a, a meeting around, hey, guys, we need to come back to our core. This is our core. This is what we're supposed to be doing. And if we're stepping out of line, we need to hold each other accountable. And so, you know, as, as much as we feel like, oh, we've matured and we're big enough. No, what, you, what is your vision? You always need to go back to that. Are you still delivering on what you set out to do? And the, the really, you know, the, the, the great thing about hubs that I find is that we are able to evolve. We are able to change. So hubs can be around for a long time. And I'm talking about hubs in general, not just a person in a hub. So when the person leaves, all of a sudden the hub is no longer there. No, it should carry on after us because it should be able to evolve into, into what it needs to be. And like I said earlier on, we don't know what, what next year holds, what the landscape is going to look like. Um, our continent is, you know, is so exciting. I get so excited because you just don't know. We just don't know what's coming next. We just don't know, you know, and, but what we do know is that we need to collaborate. We do know that we need to work together and to support one another. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Renee. Thank you, Cheryl. And thank you. Thank you, TD. I think just, just in, 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 in closing with, in, you know, in this conversation, I know it's been so I feel like we've been enriched um, with all your with all your insights and also experiences, and of course we know that. Um, thank um, really thank you to Afri Labs for giving us this opportunity, you know, to have this like pre conversation on on hub on hub solution solutions, and you know of course we it's ha we have it's happening in November, and we're like okay, so just just in your in your in this conversation today. What do you believe um, we should take today? Just listening to listening to all the panelists, um, knowing knowing the landscape, um, you know, of of the hubs and startups and entrepreneurs. What do you believe is going to be important for us to take with us to the gathering? That will, you know, just that will get that will basically um, take us post post the gathering because I believe that that is that is pretty important and I know that of course I didn't give you this 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 question but I just feel that it's so important for us to you know if if we if wrapping up and 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 just remembering you know um the conversation I think we should know like okay what what should we take to the so the question is what are we taking to the gathering what is going to be important for everyone um 
and how and how will this you know help help post um post affiliatives um i don't know who's brave enough to go to go first <laughs> um. <laughs> Okay, Tiri, yeah. you've unmuted. <laughs> to you. uh, right. Um, what I wanted to do is actually lay out six different areas, okay, um, that I believe will shape um, the growth and sustainability strategy that we are talking about. Um, and emerging in in our emerging market on uh, on the continent um and just so i don't take too much of everybody's time let me first of all list the six and then you know i can drop down into a little bit more detail i will take the rest offline for anybody who is really interested in what i have to say the first is around community engagement and development the second is around resource mobilization. The third is around strategic partnerships and collaborations. The fourth is what we're talking about earlier, which is market expansion and scalability, which looks at cross-border uh, requirements for that. At the heart of everything we're talking about, which is uh, what uh, Rene was saying earlier, innovation and adaptation. And, and finally, of course, uh, uh, just because they are important and we can't leave them out and it's critical, is policy advocacy and support. So those, those are sort of six critical areas I see that we as the AFRI Labs gathering need to be sure we address. So if you look at community engagement and development, it's about building strong local networks. It's about educational programs and workshops that work, looking at skills development, mentorship, and things like that, okay? For resource mobilization, everybody's shouting about it. Access to funding remains the single most important thing we're finding there. And it's about investment readiness programs that focus on partnerships with investors to be sure that what they want to invest in is actually available, okay? And it's critically important also to understand on the resources, our deficiencies on the infrastructure and facilities, which was being talked about earlier. We have co-working spaces. You get into somewhere and they say, oh, we don't have any power or we don't have the internet. This is supposed to be a co-working space, not to talk of access to new technologies like AI and others. Then as for strategic partnerships and collaborations, I'm not just talking local, but local to international, industry-specific, sector-focused, collaborative projects. These are things we need to engender to be sure, okay, that we can start to build the kind of capabilities we're talking about. Under market expansion and scalability, I talked about CC Hub earlier, and, you know, um, my dear friend was talking about the whole of Mozambique. We're moving into regional hub capabilities and scalability support around growth hacking strategies, expansion planning. These are things people need to be thinking about, okay? As for innovation and adaption, which is at the center all of, all of it, everybody here has talked about AI, 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 but AI is not the only emerging technology, okay? IoT is there, drones are there. There's a lot we need to about continuous improvement so that we can adapt to these trends. And like I said, finally, on policy, what can I say? You know, fortunately for us, the startup packs are kicking on across the continent, but that's not the only thing. We've got to keep on advocating for policies that support innovation and entrepreneurship. We've got to provide guidance to startups on navigating local regulations and compliance requirements, to name a few things. Of course, I, I would say this, and I, I leave so I sit actually on the Lagos State Science Research and Innovation Council, we've got to work with government agencies to launch initiatives that support startup growth and innovation. Okay. And finally, yeah, with government, collaborate. Public entities, you know, can create funding programs. Uh, this is what we believe. We were lucky, you know, we were, as ABA, we work with AFRI Labs, 
where did the funding for Catalytic Africa come from? It came from the French Development Bank. So the opportunities are there. They're just for us to be imaginative enough, collaborative enough, bring ourselves together. And yes, we can. Thanks for listening. Love it. I absolutely love it. Who shall yeah, I will here go. I will go because this one is a, a, it touches a lot of bases. I will go to um, kind of like three simple things. I think everyone that attends the gathering needs to come with clarity of three things. One, they need to define what is the value proposition. It doesn't matter if you're a government institution, DFI, like what is the thing that you actually is valuable for you? You need to understand that. The second thing that like, you need to understand, like why, how, what kind of, uh, how do you materialize that in the product or service and so on? Because from that, you need, you will understand, like what kind of partners do I need to? What kind of, what is my audience at the end of the day? And last but not least, it is about deployment because at the end of the day, distribution is king. You can build the best thing, whatever it is. You can have the best policy if no one knows it. Forget about it. So defining those three things, what is the value proposition that every single one of us can come, can bring to the table, will incite different kind of conversations. Because if I'm sitting with someone that can provide me a level, a distribution level, I will know what to have, a how to have that conversation because I'm clear and what is the value that I'm looking for, what is the value that I'm capable of producing, so on and so forth. So those three key things is for individuals and organization. If you are clear about that, I think you will find people across every stage that we will be inside, outdoors, and so on, and have a meaningful conversation. Because you cannot approach an investor if you're not clear what is the thing that you bring to the table and why you need that investor, if that investor can match you at what level. So that for me, those three key things are important for this readiness that we are talking about here. Not just investment readiness, innovation readiness, and also the fundamentals of business readiness. Because at the end of the day, team is just the fundamentals of business readiness. So have those three key things, bring it to the table. That will incite better and better conversation among everyone uh, at the gathering. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Alfredo. Now over to the to the ladies. Shiro, you welcome to you welcome to <laughs> Cool. Um so I think for me, everything, everything that TD and, and Faro said, I think definitely. I'm gonna give you a different challenge though. And mine is, you know, they say that favor happens when preparation meets opportunity. If you're not doing the preparation to have the right conversations, to have your, you know, your hub structured well, that you're sustainable, that you have some, you know, numbers and data to talk to, you're going to lose a number of people that you have conversations with. So that's the first thing. Understand that favor happens or luck happens when preparation meets opportunity. And this next one that I'm going to share with you is something I picked up whilst Renee was talking about. But um, Martin Luther King has a speech. Um, that he says, which is the fierce urgency of now. If you haven't read it, go Google it and go read that speech. It's a really, it's a really moving one. But he was really challenging a generation around social justice at the time. And so I think for us, this is around economic justice that I'm now challenging you to step up for. The urgency of now, I, we cannot tell you how this continent is going to start to flourish, but we need Africans to step up and really be ready for what's coming. And so I think the biggest challenge for me to you is, can you sense that urgency and can you be ready to take advantage of those opportunities? The worst thing for us as a continent and as young people on this continent is that the opportunities arise and we're sitting complacent. And so if you're gonna do anything in the next couple of months, it's to prepare yourself so that when you come into that room, you have a goal and you're ready to go and win every conversation and leave them much better than you entered. Oh, my word, be ready. Oh, I love it. I'm so amped. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, um, Shadal.
um, last but certainly not least, over to you, um, Renee. Thank you. Wow, everyone has said everything. I'm just excited about the gathering. Um, I would suggest that when you're coming to the gathering, be prepared to be open, you know, and share. The, the reason that we have this gathering is so that people can actually share with one another um, and talk about the tough stuff, you know, the challenges. You'll be surprised. If you don't talk about it, you don't know how many people are going through the, exactly the same thing that you are when it comes to working in an ecosystem, working with innovators, working with governments. There are so many things that we are facing and we're silent about it. And so, you know, we struggle on our own and that's extremely, that's a lonely, lonely journey. As much as we encourage our innovators and our entrepreneurs in our programs to talk to each other, to do peer coaching and all these words we use with them, let us also do that. That's really important. So when we get to the gathering, we have an opportunity to have a thousand people that's across the continent, other parts of the world that are all coming one thing you know and the theme this year is uniting innovation and so i'm going to encourage everyone be open don't be afraid to share the the things that you're struggling with it because then we can share each other's burdens and we can come up with solutions together thank you so much thank you thank you so much to 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 our panelists um i'm really i'm really hoping everyone not only feel inspired but ready to to actually do do the preparations um i think i think that's <laughs> i think you'll get the most out of it if you just prepare you know um and i think our, our panelists all, all they pin that down really really well um i do have um i, I got asked can we please I mean, if even if it's just one or two, one or two questions from our from our audience, um, it would be really, really um, lovely just to hear, you know, whether it's a comment or whether it's a something that's really burning inside of you, um, to to this and this is purely to our to our audience, um, to the panelists, um, yeah. So I'm going to perhaps if we can see the audience, it would be amazing, <laughs> and not have me pin pinned up. <laughs> And then, yeah, if you are able to unmute yourself, you really have a burning question. Oh, hey, Mesa. <laughs> um, yeah. Is there anyone in the audience that feel brave enough and ready to ask any burning question? Sure. Silence. Absolute silence, Mesa. <laughs> no, this this Hello. is the other thing that okay. is funny. Hello. Show up. Yep. Yeah. Um, Go for it. Somebody is saying something. Yes, he is. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kunle Bamingwe, and mm -hmm. I'm uh, a member of the TVC Labs Committee in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, I want to say thank you to all the panelists for an insightful um, uh, discussion. Thank you very much for everything you do. Um, here in Nigeria, we appreciate TVC Labs for the support for the um the platform that they've um given to us to to communicate and to connect and to to relate with uh founders, with um angels, and even other VC uh that are supporting us. Thank you very much. I just want to appreciate everyone. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kunuli. Um, we have. Another hand up, Audrey, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone from Zimbabwe. Mine is not a question, but just to appreciate our panelists for such an insightful, um, informative and very educative uh, discussion that will help us as ecosystem builders to go back into our communities um, and help the businesses collaborate with them and help them build with attention and design for people as well as build sustainable business models. So for me, uh, as a design thinking, human-centered design thinking, educator, researcher, uh, and as a person who's helping these small businesses to be able to build uh, with intention, this was quite informative. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to our panelists. We really appreciate you for this. Thank you and over. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Audrey. We have Hilda next. Over to you, Hilda. Over to you, Hilda. 
Oh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Hilda from Cameroon. I'm happy to be here. So um, I have a question to the panelists. So I'd like to find out how do you build um, collaboration? Because we are a hub, but our focus is on IoT. But IoT is not really something that's quite common, especially in um, our community. So we're just getting, we are still at the level where we are trying to really create awareness, get to people to understand why the relevance of IoT in African technology right now. So how do you, how do you build collaboration in, in such um, uh, in such a community and as well as maybe Africa as a whole. Hilda, was that for a specific panelist or? No, any of them. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I can take so a, a, a short uh, kind of like uh, tap on this. Uh, the thing about uh, often and none, like uh, when I see businesses, is like uh, you put the technology first and the value comes second. So like do the other way around. So like people care about okay. solving their own needs. Like the network mm -hmm. op operates the same way. So you need to understand what are the needs that are in place here that you can kind of like achieve using the technology that you can achieve. So your network will come around about this understanding what is the value thing that the, the, they are seeking, like who are the ones that are operating and at what level of this value chain. And that uh -huh. is how you create. Always understand the value chain, where things start and end, and uh -huh. delivering that value. And on that value chain, you will find who are the key players at what uh -huh. stage. And those are the ones that you can start to create your network around that. Because you will find uh -huh. people that will deal with legal. The, the other ones can be IPs. The other one uh -huh. can be the technology itself in terms of production. You uh -huh. will have this, but you also have kind of like a mirror in other countries. There are building yeah. similar things that you need to tap on. And, and today, also value chain to understand how they're managing such, a, such, such as kind of like uh, what is their journey and how they're managing uh -huh. certain struggles that you might face. So design first the value chain, understand what is the value, understand where are the steps and who are the players in each of the steps. And that's uh -huh. how you can design the perfect network to know who you need to, to interact with, to create, uh -huh. to get the most value out of the, the 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 whatever industry sector or technology yeah. that you might be using. Thank you. I yeah. hope it helps. Yeah, it sure does. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. To add, to add just a little bit to that. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, you also need to look at it, I agree, 100% holistically. And that is you are becoming part of an ecosystem. So yeah. who are who are the key technology companies, the leading IoT companies like IoT.nxt, Vodafone, yeah. Vodafone, Converge IoT, those companies yeah. you need to engage with. They're prominent startups like Twigger, that's using yeah. IoT for improving agriculture, M Pharma, that's yes. managing pharmaceuticals, okay, sensor it. Uh, in Nigeria here that's uh, doing IoT solutions for environmental monitoring. So that's another sector of the ecosystem. Then you have institutions, okay, like the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, AIMS, the oh. University of Cape Town, then Strathmore in uh, Nairobi there. Yeah, um, okay, those, yeah. Those are exactly. And then looking at the government itself, okay, there's Smart Africa, Secretariat in uh -huh. Rwanda, okay. Yeah. Uh, the Communications Authority of Kenya is another one I quite like because they've gotten into all the regulatory okay. uh, components of that. And then finally, don't forget the investors too. They are also looking, you know, for people like you to be able to engage. I'm talking of Partech, uh, for example, TLCom, uh, CRE Venture Capital, okay. And finally, of course, the industry association. So IoT Africa Network, Africa Internet of Things Alliance, and GSMA wow. Africa. 
So I trust, you know, by the time you've dug through all of those and they know who you are, you, you'll be on your way. I trust that helps. Yes. Thank you so much, Didi. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for your question, Hilda, and thank you so much to our panelists um, who responded almost immediately. Um, are there any other questions? No questions, no answers. Um, I'm going to ask Mesa, is there any final words from, from you? Well, thank you for this insightful conversation. I really enjoyed today's panel. Thank you, dear panelists and guests and friends of Aquilabs. Uh, so yeah, looking forward for the next webinar. Uh, please stay tuned, follow us on uh, the AfriLab social media channels. But then we're expecting all of you to join us for our AfriLab's annual gathering in Cape Town, co-hosted and in partnership with our labs team. Thank you, everyone. Been, it's been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you to um, our panelists once again, TD from TVC Labs, um, Cheryl Jacob from E Squared Investments, Renee Parker. Um, she's also the AfriLab Southern Board member, as well as Alfredo Kudo from Indidio Ventures Studio. It's been absolutely incredible. And again, to everyone who joined today, Get yourself registered. Um, the dates are from the 6th to the 8th of November, 2024. You don't want to miss out. Of course, there's going to be more pre-conversations, other tracks. I mean, this was only the first one. So thank you, everyone, for sticking it out during your lunchtime. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's it from myself, Chrissy Nicola Tafel. Again, thank you. Bye. Bye now. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much, Mesa. <laughs>